Welcome, readers, listeners, and viewers from across America and around the world. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio. I appreciate all of you taking the time to join us this evening and for bearing with us. We have uh, had a few technical difficulties, but I'm honored to be on with Congressman Fulton Sheen. Fulton, are you there, brother? I am here. Wonderful. And I appreciate you taking the time to to join me as well. And uh, thank you, Mitchell, for hooking us up. It's um, It's been a long time coming. I know we've tried uh, to do a number of shows now, and something has always conflicted. And so I'm really glad that we're able to jump on this platform and to be able to share your story. Uh, I also understand that you are now broadcasting and that you have a a live show as well, Fulton. So if you would, can you tell the listening audience your website, contact information about your show and anything else that you'd like to share? Well, sure. Um, I've basically been uh, doing a show on Tuesday nights from 7 to 9 Eastern Standard Time. And uh, the, uh, the show lasts for about an hour. And it, uh, it's, it's been uh, on uh, crossing over. I've been using uh, Jessica Arianas' uh, uh, YouTube channel. But uh, you can find uh, information about this on both crossing over as well as uh, my uh, blog, which is FultonSheenUpdates.com. That's FultonSheenUpdates.com. And uh, you can see the various different shows there and the PowerPoints that went with them. And, uh, and when I do a, do a show, I'm, I'm very happy to send you all my information because uh, I kind of looking, I, I kind of have the same copyright rules as, uh, as uh, they have over at IHOP. You should copy it as much as you can and get it out mm-hmm. to as many people as you can. Right on. Right on. Uh, my goal is to try to help prepare people uh practically spiritually financially uh all kinds of different ways for all that's coming our way because we're told to be watchmen we're told to be alert and be ready and be prepared and make sure all of our lamps are full absolutely um can you tell us a little bit about your journey to awakening um and you have a an interesting story in that you have had um, been in a position to actually make an impact and to affect change. And so if you would just share a little bit about your story as far as your journey to awakening and on, you know, different concepts and different themes that were instrumental in your life and that affected you deeply. Well, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, Basically, uh, when when my wife and I, shortly after, you know, we got married, uh, we were, you know, seeking the Lord as to what it was, you know, we were supposed to do, and uh, and as we did that, um, we were sensing, you know, that uh, we were supposed to get involved in the society and the culture around us, and and uh, begin to put forth the the scriptural worldview of how things are supposed to be. And so and so you know in in my life the the when when uh, when I was about 17, I was uh, I ended up going over to these people's house that I knew were young life leaders because I had been uh, involved with going to young life and I had this problem and I asked told them about, you know, my problem. And they said, well, did you ever think of giving it to the Lord? And I said, well, you you know, you have to understand this is not a, you know, religious problem. This is a personal problem. And they said, well, they said, it said, lay down your burden, you'll lighten your load. And, and, uh, and I said, yep, I know it says that. And they said, you've tried everything else, haven't you? And I said, I have. So they told me about, you know, accepting Jesus. No one had really told me about that before no one had told me about uh yeshua and and so uh 
And so consequently, I said, well, I go to church. And they said, well, it's nice that you go to church, you know, but jumping in a lake doesn't make you a fish and sitting in a garage doesn't make you a car and going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Mm -hmm. And so that night I went home and, you know, I accepted uh, him into my life. And I literally was, you know, I was reading one of those little daily bread guides and, and, and the last sentence of that daily bread guide said, isn't it a relief you have somewhere to turn, but isn't it a shame that it took you so long? And it was like the first thing that where, you know, I read scripture and I read this thing and God spoke and, and, and basically told me, you know, right after I had given him this problem and accepted him, he, you know, he, he actually answered my prayer. And so that was my first rewrite, if you will, kind of like when you're going from Windows 7 to Windows 10, it, it was the first rewrite. And then the second rewrite that occurred is when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And each time it kind of rewrote my operating system. It let me see things differently than I had seen them before. I heard things, saw things, understood things differently. And then uh, the third rewrite, which I don't think is over yet, is when I began to understand uh, what it means uh, to 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 walk in my my Hebraic heritage, to understand what it means to walk in God's inst uh, instructions and His and uh, under His direction and and under His commandments, it just it just kind of changed everything. And 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 the light switch at that point was. I was literally mowing the lawn. I have a very big lawn, so it takes two hours. So I always listen to something, um, and I get great revelation when I'm mowing the lawn. So I, I watched um, that one um, Jim Staley uh, presentation uh, about truth and tradition, and it's just like it, – it, it, I mean, it, it was like I thought, wow. It just opened up my mind, heart, and spirit, and it's not like – I didn't believe in those things already, but it was like it just connected all the dots for me. And that's set me down the path that, you know, I'm I'm on today. And and so so those are kind of the 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 rewrites that I experienced. And and but then in the midst of it all, uh, when I was uh, when when my wife and I began to ask the Lord, what what was it? that I was supposed to do, or we were supposed to do, uh, we heard, I'm going to send you into missions. So we said, where? And he says, not where. I'm going to send you to a realm, the political realm. And so we began to get active politically. We began to campaign for different uh, officials that were following the Lord. We began to, uh, we began to write letters uh, I, I managed a U.S. Senate campaign in the two counties where we were. And then the next thing I knew, um, I, the following year, I ended up running for county treasurer and I was elected twice, uh, in that. Um, and, uh, uh, I oversaw the, the, uh, about $55 million portfolio in Allegan County, Michigan. And then, I ran for state representative, and you could serve three two-year terms in the state of Michigan, and uh, I served three two-year terms. And so, and so for a time, uh, the Lord had us moving in the political realm, and, and we, uh, you know, we, we learned a lot of things. And, and, so, and so that was, that was the, the place and my calling. But during that time— um, in, when Hurricane Katrina hit, I was with a number of uh, pastors in the community, and one of them said, you know, gosh, this has taken out four states, 100 miles deep, and everybody's focused on New Orleans, and no one's paying attention to any other area. None of the rural areas are getting any focus. So that was Saturday morning after the Wednesday that it had hit, and on the following Thursday, just four days later, we had uh, six vehicles, 18, uh, 18 people, and um, just filled with provisions. And we went down to uh, Mississippi area, and we went to two places down there. And then the following week, we 
we had like 62 people and literally uh, the biggest uh, truck that that uh, U-Haul had. And um, I don't even know how many vehicles. And we went down down there again. And this kept happening over and over and over. And I mean, it was pretty miraculous because, I mean, sometimes it can take a church you know, two weeks to pot, plan a potluck, but somehow all these people gathered together and this just kept happening. And so we created a group called Isaiah 5812, which is a nonprofit disaster relief group. And we've now been assisting in disasters. And then um, our, our uh, county emergency manager told us, uh, I said, hey, you know, your guys are already doing what we need to train people to do. And there's this program called CERT, Community Emergency Response Teams. And if if we get uh, a team like this, then we qualify for some federal funding that can help our county in the, in the event of a disaster. Would some of your people take this course? And I said, sure. So we had a bunch of people take the course, about 40 of them. And then he said, you should teach this course. So then I got certified to teach the course. And now we We've trained over 1,600 people uh, in Michigan and across the U.S. to fir- work with first responders in search and rescue, uh, emergency triage and medical, uh, terrorist mitigation, disaster psychology. And, and, and so the very cool thing about that is, is when, when, when all of these things hit the fan, Many of these volunteer groups are going to be what most counties and cities across the U.S., you know, small cities, are going to look to because, you know, they're going to be the people that are going to be, they're going to call upon to help in these disasters. And it's a wonderful position to be able to be in. But I've learned so many things, but I started be, I started this quest of preparation and being ready for whatever came our way. And and the one of the very important things that you know, we do in a training like that. And quite frankly, what we try to teach people in any kind of preparation or training, including scriptural ones, is we want to be able to train ourselves, become disciplined, and we want to learn to respond to what's going on, not react. Everybody's going to react, but what we want to do is we want to learn to respond we want to think about what's happening and what's coming, and we want to look at what Scripture says, and we want to think about how to prepare so that we can be ready when that thief comes. So we won't be like the five virgins that weren't ready. We can right. be like the five right. virgins that were ready. So so that kind of gives you an idea of, of kind of where we've come from and, and, and how my assignment is is just to help prepare that end time remnant for all that's coming our way. Well, that's a most excellent endeavor and certainly something that is necessary and needed um, because we saw, you know, during the whole thing with uh, Katrina that government delayed assistance and a lot of people suffered and a lot of people even died and lost their lives um, due to waiting for and being dependent upon others and not being self-sufficient in any manner to even have a little bit of food or storage or, you know, emergency items, medical kits, anything of that nature uh, that, you know, Katrina, the shelves were wiped out in the first three hours and then there was weeks before supplies were able to get in there maybe even months and um because of that a lot of people went through a lot of tragedy uh, unfortunate um so can you speak on that just as far as you know having uh, even a small uh, as far as food and water batteries whatever and the recommendations that you have for individuals in just keeping a, a small surplus, um, even if you know they don't have a lot of money, can't afford uh, to have you know a year's supply of dehydrated food. Uh, just what would be your recommendation for um, what to set aside and to slowly gather items over time if that's what needs to happen? Well, I mean, you're right when you say that everybody can do something. 
sometimes being ready or trying to prepare for some people seem to be this huge onimous uh, uh, task. But when we were over there and they, they sent, uh, they sent a bunch of people to, to watch some of the rehab that we were doing, they said, well, how do you deal with so many families and so many places, you know, that were hit? What, what do you do? I said, well, you do one family at a time yeah, and then you move over to the next house and then you do that one. But preparation is like that. You want to set realistic goals for yourself that you can begin to, to do. And so one of the best things to do is to sit down and have a family discussion. And that family discussion may be with grandma, grandpa, it could be with dad and mom, it could be with the kids, it could be with, um, you know, depending on all the ages, whatever that family discussion is for you, you bring your family together and you say, well, let's just talk about what would we do if there was a natural disaster, if there was a terrorist act, if there was a financial collapse, well, what would we do? And in many of the things that you do, it doesn't matter whether it's a natural disaster or financial collapse or, or something, it, 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 you're going to do some of the same basic things. So the first, the first unit that we teach is called come up with a plan, because if you don't have a plan, obviously you're not going to be able to, you know, know what to do and you're going to be in a panic because you're not going to be prepared just like everybody else. So what do you do? Well, you, you think, okay, what are the most important needs? Well, first of all, it's water, food, and heat. And electricity may be, you know, a little bit distanced from those three most important things. So you begin to think, well, okay, what about water? Well, depending on where you live, if you live out in you know, in the country and, uh, and, or you live in a subdivision where you still have a well, we well, have a well. And, and, uh, if you have a generator, you don't always have to keep that well on all the time. You just need to turn it on when necessary, fill up all the pipes and, and use them sparingly in, you know, if there are, isn't any electricity, but you can be able to, you know, get at water that way. And which means, of course, you also have to have some substantial amounts of gasoline. But again, you don't have to turn that generator on and run everything all the time. You just have to run it for a while. So, so another way to, to get water is to have a water filtration system. So if you don't have access to water like that, you would be able to go get water out of a lake, out of a pond, out of a creek, out of a river, um, you know, depending on where you are and you would pour it through these filters and there, there, these filters are 99.7%. Uh, they filter out, um, all the stuff that's there. So literally that water would be absolutely horrible. It would have to be for this, for most of the, you know, a good filter filtration system to work. And, and, and where, and how much can you buy those things? Well, you probably can buy them from anywhere from $75 to, to, I mean, you can spend a lot of money, but you could, you could buy a decent water filtration system for somewhere between 75 and $150, as long as you're not caring about whether it's, whether it's uh, really pretty and nice and flashy, or you're just looking for the basic unit. So once you've got your water figured out, um, another thing to do for water too, just one more thing there is you can buy some barrels, uh, get yourself some plastic food grade barrels, hook them up to your downspouts mm -hmm. and you rain literally, barrels. Rain and, barrels. yeah, rain barrels. And you can literally have that water come down and it won't go any further after the barrel is full. It'll just simply go down, uh, go down the system there. And then you just dip into the barrels and you throw the water through the water fil fil filters that you've purchased. So there's a lot of different ways. So there's some ideas for water, um, heat, you know, one of the best ways for heat, I think one of the cheapest and simplest ways is go out and get yourself a, uh, a, a wood stove. I mean, we bought, we bought a wood stove on, uh, on a Craigslist. Oh, uh, I think we bought one for 125 and one for 150. And so we bought two of them and we installed the one, uh, downstairs and we have another one that if things got difficult, we'd install upstairs. And so uh, we have all the piping to hook the one upstairs if we needed it. But at the moment, we have the one downstairs. And we live out in the country, so it's not if the electricity goes out. It's 
when the hit uh, right. Right. It goes out. So we have that we have that stove there, and and we then built a woodshed, and of course we put wood in the woodshed so that we would have you know fuel for that, and so. So that's probably the cheapest, easiest way. Now, there's all kinds of different ways you can figure out to, you know, to heat things. But uh, that's probably the cheapest way to do it. And you can continue to feed it through, you know, with just wood. And um, almost anybody could probably put them enough money together to get a wood stove. And so that way, if if you could only afford one, well, you at least can get around the wood stove if it got and so you've covered water, you've covered, uh, you've covered heat, and and food, food. There's a variety of different things that you can do, but basically, um, you can start a garden and uh, grow your own heirloom. You know, get some heirloom seeds, some uh, uh, seeds that can produce seeds, and then you can take the seeds from what you produced and make more the next year. But but get some seeds and, and put a garden together. And if you don't have real good soil, then make it a raised garden and put some blocks around it and put your own dirt inside of it. But you can be able to produce a lot. Most of the time, our gardens produce more than we can eat, and they're not very big. So, you know, you can, you can, you can do a lot with a home garden. But uh, the other thing is, is, you know, you can go to the store and you can buy various goods. Um, you can buy, you know, certain various canned goods. And, you know, you might okay, something's on tuna's on sale. So you buy a case of tuna and you take the bottom case of tuna and you put it on top of the new case that you bought and you just eat off of it. And, and you circulate your, your, your food stuffs the same way a grocery store does, putting the stuff that was bought uh, that is oldest on top and using that from day to day and putting the other stuff on the bottom. And, and you begin to think of, well, what would I need? And so, you know, the other thing you can do, we, you can buy some uh, bulk foods uh, like, you know, rice and beans, uh, pinto beans, black beans, lentils. I mean, it may be boring, but rice and beans provides you with uh, your carbs and with your with your proteins. And uh, they may be boring, but they sure can last a long time. And, and, and you can buy it in bulk, which... Many times you can, you know, lower the value or the cost of purchasing it substantially. And, uh, and there's many places that you can do that. And, of course, you can get the freeze-dried stuff, which is really wonderful and lasts forever. But there's, there's all kinds of long-term shelf life things that you can buy um, that uh, are inexpensive, um, there's, uh, that, that you can store in your basement. And if you get store it in five-gallon buckets, for example – you can store a lot of five gallon buckets in your basement. You can put them four high and you just put them on there. And in the event that you needed it, well, it's there. And so you just buy it little by little, you know, maybe you can't buy things all at once or buy huge, huge amounts, but you just put it into your budget and say, well, we're going to spend this much this month uh, on, you know, some additional food stuffs. And you just begin to collect it. So it, it's not something that you have to do like, right now um if you have the ability to do some bulk buying well great and if you don't well then buy it little by little and uh and and you'll be amazed at how quickly you you can do that another thing that you should do is um even even in the course that that i teach come up with a plan it suggests that you have three months worth of of uh like cash at home in one form or another, so that you could weather out some type of financial crisis, even a natural crisis. If your area gets hit by a tornado and a flood, are any of your banks going to work? Well, no, they're not. And and so having having some money at home is a wise idea. And we usually suggest that you know one way to uh, utilize your your cash is to have a third in U.S. dollars, a third in uh, a foreign currency, and a third in silver rounds, which is basically just one troy ounce of silver. And the reason we suggest it in that way, we suggest having three months worth of income. So if, for example, if your monthly income is, is $3,000 a month, um, well, then you can have, you know, you'd, you'd have 
uh, if you wanted to have three months worth of supply, you'd have three thousand dollars of U.S. dollars and three thousand dollars of uh, another currency and three thousand dollars of silver rounds. And and so the idea is, um, in in a in in you you'd get a currency like say Australian currency, or New Zealand or Canadian. All those are considered commodity currencies. And so, for example, in 2008, when uh, if you would have gotten any one of those currencies, they were about 70 cents to the American dollar. And let's say you took 100, uh, 100 Australian dollars and you stuck it in the kitchen drawer. And if you would have done that before November of 2008, um, they would have been 70 cents to the American dollar. So, you know, you you would purchase that, put them away, put put them away. Two months uh, or two years later, after we had print, printed eight trillion dollars in simply two years, that went from being thirty cents uh, less than the dollar or seventy cents to the American dollar to being eleven cents more than the American dollar. So those dollars sitting in the kitchen drawer grew forty one percent in less than two nice. years. So so then you know if the banks do have an issue and they and let's say they close the banks. And they'll usually only close for two to six weeks because they need to open them back up in order to get the government money and everybody else money. But but what happens during those two to six weeks is they literally count all the physical cash that exists. Then they figure out how many people have deposit accounts and then they figure out how much they can get each person. And once they come up with that number, they may say, well, you can have $50 a week or $100 a week or whatever it is they would come up with. And then that's all you can get at no matter how much money you had in the bank. So that's what they're doing. But if you do have foreign currency and you were to bring it in the bank, they have no problem giving you the differential because they'll make 1% generally on the, on the trade. And, uh, and you're trading apples to apples, so you would still be able to get at uh, additional cash. And, and if you started – and if what happened in 2008 happened again, well, gosh, 40% is not, not bad. And uh, and then silver is the same way. I, I suggest silver rounds – as opposed to maybe gold rounds, unless you have a substantial amount that you want to keep at home. But if if silver doubles in price from 17, like it is right around now, um, okay, well, that's $35. And, you know, if you buy something for $40, well, gosh, okay, you get $5 change. But how are you going to divide up one ounce of gold? That'll, that'll be a little more difficult. So from a practical standpoint, where you're trying to keep cash aside, you can bring bring home the silver rounds and what are they valued? Well, whatever silver closed at the, the day before, um, that's what they're valued until it closes out again. So it's very easy to determine. So all in all, it's it's a great mix. And and last time, you know, silver uh, went up to about forty nine dollars an ounce in the last crisis, and currently it's about seventeen. And it hasn't been uh, gold and silver hasn't been at the at the price levels they are now since probably 2000, 2013 was the last time you had 1500 or more for gold or $17 for silver. So they've gone up about 25% this year. And uh, and depending on what happens with the market, um, you know, they're probably going to continue uh, as the market gets shakier and shakier to go up more and more in value. That's a, that's a normal occurrence. Yeah, um, people really like to have, you know, uh, some silver and some gold if necessary, even smaller pieces. But uh, you are also um, a proponent of digital currencies and Bitcoin. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, sure. And 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 the thing about it is, is one thing that I think is very important for people to understand is most people don't understand what cryptocurrency is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and they think it's an investment. And although some people have done very, very well, the last two years, most people haven't done very, very well. Cryptocurrency is a tool. It's, it's, it's another form of currency. It's a digital representation of paper currency, um, uh, electronic debits and credits. And, and that's what cryptocurrency is. And it fluctuates against other cryptocurrencies as well as fluctuating against the paper currencies that exist now. And there's over 1,600 of these cryptocurrencies that currently exist, and they're referred to as blockchain technology. And so the method of legal tender 
to whoever agrees to accept it is just like any other currency. But unlike fiat currency, paper currency, which basically is connected to a nation's ability to tax its people, cryptocurrencies aren't attached to anything. So pretty much what gives it the value? Well, you do. Because if you had a car that you said was worth $5,000 and I said, well, you know, I got $5,000 of Ripple currency. Will you take $5,000 of Ripple currency for your car? And if you say yes, well, hey, we got a deal. And, and so, so cryptocurrency is just another type of, of, of currency. And what I think is going on and what I see happening today is, is uh, cryptocurrencies fluctuate. Um, as I said before, um, but despite their volatility, um, central banks, commercial banks, governments, government organizations uh, are continuing to start to move towards a digital currency. The IMF, which is the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, are working now to establish their, uh, their own private blockchain network uh, to create a distributed ledger technology. And a DLT basically refers to a technological infrastructure and protocols that allow simultaneous access and validation and record updating in an immutable manner across a network spread across multiple entities or locations. Now that's the definition of what a DLT is by an investor encyclopedia. And right now, Russia is looking to create its own cryptocurrency backed by gold for international settlements. And if they actually do that, um, a lot of people will flock to that. Now, Bank of America's CEO, Brian Monahan, uh, spoke out last month and he said, embracing digital payment transactions while moving towards a cashless society, he said the Bank of America are just going to continue to move towards a digital banking transactions. We want a cashless society. And so they know it's coming. And banks were resistant at first, um, the same way uh, auto, auto producers were resistant to an electrical car at first. And uh, it now appears, too, that Facebook is attempting to dip its hand in yet another pot and have announced they wanted to come out with their own cryptocurrency called Libra. However, especially lately, they've been experiencing uh, uh, some you know, pushback from the U.S., other nations, as well as major partners um, who have changed their mind about participating. Uh, as I understand it, um, just as of late, Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, and a number of other uh, number of other companies and corporations have backed out of uh, being part of the Libra rollout. So we'll see what happens. But I think the future of cryptocurrencies is 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 going to soon come around because because quite frankly, it's still kind of the wild wild west. If if you're in a part of a cryptocurrency which is on a cryptocurrency exchange, an exchange can be regulated and can be shut down and can be controlled by a government the same way the New York Stock Exchange, the OTC Exchange, any kind of money exchange. They basically ruled that a cryptocurrency exchange can be regulated just like those. That's why they've been able to shut some of those down. Um, but what they can't shut down is what's called a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. The example I gave earlier of buying a car from you for $5,000. Uh, uh, cryptocurrency dollars, um, basically being able to do that. They can't control a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. They don't know when it's going to happen. They don't know how it's happened. And there's no ledger that, at least at this point, that they can look to see what happens. So right now, cryptocurrencies are being vastly used in China, vastly used over in Venezuela, who's financial system is just, you know, in shambles and they have a 1,343% inflation rate. So cryptocurrencies are, you know, are, have, have value in a time of difficulty. Now the con side of cryptocurrencies is sooner or later, 
I believe the one world currency is going to be a cryptocurrency. Because if I wanted to rule the world and I wanted to decide who got to buy things and who didn't get to buy things, I would create a cryptocurrency that I could control and I could turn off and turn on whoever I wanted. So eventually, I think that it'll be a digital uh, currency that'll be a one world currency at some point in the future. And, and the other thing about a one world currency, too, is a one world currency, if you if you have a cryptocurrency and you have negative interest rates, like we have over in the EU, the European Union is 27 nations of which 19 are a part of a common currency called the euro and a part of the European Central Bank. They have a negative 0.4 interest rate, which means if you put money in the bank, you actually lose 0.4% on any money you stick in the bank. In Japan, you have a negative 0.1, same situation. But if you had a cryptocurrency and you had a negative interest rate attached to that cryptocurrency, well, they could go as negative as they want and nobody could take their money out. You know, like for an example, over in Germany for the last few years, what's been the one of, one of the top uh, retail items? Well, safe because the Germans just can't stomach losing money and putting it in the bank. So they bought all these safes and they're keeping their cash at home. So, but in a digital environment, if that's all you had, well, you know, you couldn't do that. So as long as you can put that fiat currency in your pocket, you have some anonymity. But when the time comes where um, they have uh, a currency which pretty much can track everything that you buy, kind of like what you buy on the internet, um, well, that anonymity goes away. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I, I do agree with you. I think that, you know, the New World Order, they've been stating for a very long time that they want to move to a cashless society. We see that uh, credit cards and debt and things of that manner have been implemented and that uh, cash is increasingly becoming scarce. Um to some degree and so can you also talk about just a little bit about your awakening to the new world order and what you see on the horizon with um, you know with our 21 trillion dollars in debt and the reset that they have uh, spoken about in the protocols uh, of the learned elders of zion and uh, what seems to be a plan. I know a lot of people believe this to be a disinformation or something that was contrived in uh, some time in uh, history in the past. But the fact that it is playing out in the manner that it was written hundreds of years ago, in my mind, shows that there's some substance to it. And so would you mind commenting on that? Well, I mean, here we're in a situation right now, and, and, and initially right now, we should probably, uh, probably walk you through a little bit of a history lesson so that I could answer that question better. Yes, please. And so, so one of the things that we, we need to understand is how did we get to where we are today? So, so let's, let's zip on over to 1944 uh, in what they called the Brenton Wood Accords. Now, the purpose of the Brenton Wood Accords is they all the Western nations, they came together and they said, you know, we've had two world, war, two world wars in the last 20 years, and we got to come up with a new plan here because, because if the only way for a nation to grow, if the model is to go blow up your neighbor and take over their country, it, it, it's just not working. So we got to find another way for a nation to be able to to enter in to the the, uh, uh, the the world commerce, which which would allow them to utilize the resources and the uh, and the stuff that they have in their country <clears throat> and trade it with the rest of the world, and so what they did was they they said, well, what well, we're going to create what's called the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. And what do they do? Well, they monitor stuff. That's that's what they do. Like so far this year, twice, they've lowered the, the world growth rate, saying that they don't think things are going as well as they did. They started off with one projection and they lowered it twice. Now, they'll do that 
for the world. They'll do that for a particular nation. But they monitor places so that if something looks like it's getting in trouble or that country's having too many issues, they go in and they make an effort to try to help that country. And this is the concept. That was the concept that was, uh, was, was done. Now, has it been abused? It's been abused, but this was the idea. So the World Bank then was created, and it had seven other countries in it. And those, so those countries, would they, they would do this. They'd say, Costa Rica, you know, you got a lot going for you. But here's your problem. You have no transportation system. You can't get the products that you have in the ground over to the marketplace. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to lend you a billion dollars. And, and we're going to lend you that money and you're going to build a transportation system so you can be a part of the world community because you've got stuff that nobody else has. And, you know, we're going to give it to you for a good rate. What do you say? And Costa Rica says, well, OK, sounds good. So what would happen then is the World Bank would go to those seven nations, which were based upon the market share of world markets, and they'd get a billion dollars and they'd send it over to Costa Rica and they'd give them a good interest rate. and they build their transportation system. So this is what went on, um, you know, for for met, for many years. And at first they'd handled it well and they were doing a good job with it. And who was pretty much in control of most of the, the IMF and the World Bank? Well, the United States was because it had the greatest market share. And so it also, the U.S. dollar became the world's reserve currency. And what's the world's reserve currency? It's the currency in which any nation can trade with another nation and they don't have to have a treaty to do it. Because let's face it, after World War II, there were a lot of nations that didn't like each other. Let's face it today, there's a lot of nations that don't like each other. However, they could still trade back and forth even if they didn't have any formal treaty as long as they used the world's reserve currency. And so it went from Britain being the world's reserve currency, the pound, but before that it was it was France, and before that it was uh, Spain, and before that it was Portugal. So the, the world reserve currency hasn't always been the U.S. dollar, of course. But the world reserve currency, whatever nation that is, has a great advantage over everybody else because that means that their currency is probably going to be used more by, 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 by the world than any other currency. And is that the case for the U.S.? Yeah, about 80% of every deal Everything that goes on in world trade happens in dollars. And so uh, that's a great advantage. Back in 2008, it was also a great advantage because we printed all that money. And unlike all the other nations who printed money and really got hurt, we could spread out the watering down of our dollar to the whole world. But but this time, that's not going to happen. And, and we'll talk a little bit about why here in just one second. And so and so. The, the Brenton Wood Accords set in place a lot of the systems that we, that we have today. And, and the U.S. has been in firm control of that for quite a long time. And then we had this thing called uh, the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications, or what we know in short as the SWIFT code. That went live in 1977. And the only way up until this year. The only way you could wire money from one place to another in the whole the whole world was to use the SWIFT code. And who's in many ways in charge of the SWIFT code? Well, the US. And 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 they started abusing it. They started going to nations and they'd say, you know, Bolivia, we like you. But you know, you're doing this, and, and we really don't want you to do this. And, you know, if you keep doing this, well, we're going to have to turn you off. And, you know, that's really going to be a problem if you can't take money, wire money in and out of. I mean, that's really going to mean you, you, you can't, you know, your country's probably going to go broke, and there's not a lot you can do about that. And you, you don't want us to do that, do you, Bolivia? And Bolivia goes, no. So here's the deal. If you stop doing this, well, you know, then – we won't turn you off. And, you know, we'll throw a few tanks and bombs in so you can blow up people you don't like. What do you think? And Bolivia says, uh, okay. So then you have a situation where uh, Bolivia is kind of forced to do whatever it is uh, the U.S. wants. And, and so 
that's the way it's used incorrectly. But another way it's used is when you have these rogue nations out there who are doing things that pretty much almost the entire international community doesn't want them doing, like Iran, like Turkey, like North Korea. And and basically they have um, their ability to trade or to use the SWIFT code cut off. And so that makes it very difficult for them to do any business. And they also can sanction them. And why do people have to pay fines from, from, the, uh, from the U.S. when we sanction them? Well, it's because anybody that uses our currency in any kind of deal, um, according to the Brenton Wood Accords, you can sanction them. So anybody that uses U.S. dollars, well, the U.S. can sanction. Anybody that uses euros, well, the Europe can sanction. So that's that's played a big part and been a non-military option that they can be able to apply pressure to a country to stop doing something it ought not to be doing. But just literally in the last month, there's been a, a new development. And and so so now Russia has created a new international wire system. They've been working on it a long time. But literally two weeks ago, they basically said to, to uh, uh, Turkey and to Iran, you know, if you wanted to be a part of a new wire system, we, you could wire money in and out of your, your country using our system. And so they opened it up to th- those two nations, which now enables those two nations to circumvent the sanctions, some of the sanctions, and and being able to get money in and out of their country and not use the SWIFT code. And then a few weeks later, they opened it up to all, any nation that wants to join and be involved. So this literally has just happened recently. And that means that the U.S. influence and the EU influence is going to be diminished as we go into the future. And the Russian influence is, Russian influence is going to be increased. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge change that's gone on, but it's not the only change that's gone on. In 2016, for the, for, for, since the Bretton Woods Accords were put in place for 72 years, there was only one other world bank in the world today. But today there's now two world banks because in 2016, in January of 2016, the, the AIIB Bank went into place. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank began to do business and compete against the World Bank. So what happened where the AIIB Bank came from is back in 2014, the BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, and China, and South Africa said, you know, we're getting the shaft from all these guys. Let's get our own World Bank. So they put in about $50 billion between them, and they said, we're going to have a six-month time period, and we're going to open up to the rest of the world, and anybody who joins during that six-month window is going to is going to have a vote. And, you know, anybody that joins, nobody's vote's going to be more important or bigger than the other person's vote, and they'll be charter members. And after that, anybody can join, but they won't have a vote. And so, so basically... Uh, two weeks before that deadline was over, about 29 nations had joined. And the U.S. criticized the whole process the whole time, all along the way, and, and, and uh, basically said, well, they shouldn't be doing this. And, but uh, up until that moment, not a whole lot of nations other than those big nations I just explained were a part of it. But the game changer occurred on Friday, March 13th, when the U.K. joined the AIIB Bank. And then what happened in the next two weeks? Almost every nation, almost every large nation in the world joined, except the United States. Mm-hmm. So, so the United States could still join, but we haven't, um, but, but we'll never have a vote. And so, so why is that important? Well, it's important because now that bank is lending out uh, currency dollars, and it divides up those dollars the same way the World Bank does, except with other nations, which means there's a diminished use of U.S. dollars in the world because there's another bank doing it. Plus, 
this other bank now can function and operate and they don't have to rely upon the World Bank and they don't have to re rely upon the SWIFT code. If they so chose, they have another option. Again, that's something that it's never existed up until recently. And so the other thing that occurred is the Chinese yuan was added to one of the seven world currencies in the World Bank, further diminishing the percentages of U.S. dollars being lent out to the world. And they're a part of the IMF basket of currencies where there were four nations and now there's five. So, so the U.S. dollar is slowly being chipped away at the use uh, at, at the way it's being used around the world now it's still king it's still got 80 percent of all transactions but in the next crisis they don't have to wait for what us they don't have to rely upon us because the other thing that's occurred since 2008 at the time hardly any nation had a had a treaty to trade currency to currency with each other today almost every major nation has a currency to trade with another major nation, going currency to currency so that they don't have to use the world dollar, the, the US dollar. And so, so all of those things have gone to reduce the amount of US dollars in, in you know, going on in the world today. So that if we print money next time, it's gonna hurt us a lot more. But the other thing that's changed that is the petrodollar. And the petrodollar uh, was something that got created uh, in the 1970s by Nixon and Kissinger. And what happened was uh, you had de Gaulle from France buying gold for the fictitious rate of $35 an ounce. And why did he do that? Well, it's because in the Brenton Wood Accords, there was they pegged gold at $35 an ounce. Well, was gold more valuable than that? Yes, it was. And did, did Prime Minister uh, de Gaulle know exactly what he was doing? Well, yes, he did. So Nixon couldn't get rid of the treaty, and nor did he want to get rid of the treaty. So what Nixon did do is he completely monetized the dollar and took it off the gold standard. So, so then people weren't paying attention, and all of a sudden they said, oh my gosh, the dollar's not worth anything. And the dollar, the value of the dollar started plummeting. So so basically, Kissinger goes over to Saudi Arabia and they say, we got a deal for you. Here's the deal. If you, um, you know, right now, we're the largest exporter of crude oil in the world and you're right behind us. But if we stop selling crude oil, you would be the undisputed king of oil. And so what what we want you to do is we'll stop selling crude oil. We'll still sell refined oil, but we'll stop selling crude oil making you the undisputed king. And in return, we want you to only buy and sell uh, your oil in dollars, US dollars, every transaction. Would you do that? And Saudi Arabia goes, sure. So the petrodollar was born and that's why it was born. And then what happened in, again, in January of 2016? Well, in that 2015, Saudi Arabia had had enough of uh, President Obama giving the atomic bomb over to their, their, their biggest enemy, which is Iran, because Iran and Iraq and Syria are Shiites and Saudi Arabia and most of the rest of them are Sunnis. And so, so basically what happened was they said, we're done. We're not doing this anymore. We're going to you know, if somebody wants to do it in U.S. dollars, fine, but we're going to do it in whatever currency we want. So what happened in January of, first, January of 2016 for the first time since Nixon made that change in 1971, we sent out our first crude oil uh, uh, shipment, export to the rest of the world. And in, in the space of two short years, at the end of 2018, who's, who's the world leader in exports in oil in the world today? Well, the United States. Mm. And so, 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 but again, another great reduction in the amount of U.S. dollars in the system. So when you couple all of these different things together, the next time we start printing money, it's going to hurt us a lot more than it did back in 2009 and 2010 when we were printing. So it's always good to kind of have a, a history lesson to understand why are things the way that they are? 
and what happened to create those situations. Now, understanding all that and getting back to your question, today, China has been trying to make itself a major currency in the world. Mm -hmm. And although it is a major currency in the world, it hasn't been faring too well. But it did get a part of the IMF and the World Bank, and it did. It is now one of the you know main currencies in the new AIIB Bank. So they've made a lot of progress. But you know, if you ask most people, they'll say, "Well, you know, who would be the world cur- reserve currency if the U.S. wasn't?" And a lot of people will say China. But that's really not going to happen because China doesn't get to make that decision. The world gets makes to gets to make that decision, and absolutely nobody trusts China. So you know, that's probably not going to happen. But what we do have to understand is all these countries that want to be the number one guy and the number one currency and the number one nation, they have no intention of allowing their their currency to be encompassed with another, at least at the moment. And so right now, greed and power and position is probably going to maintain the status of the currencies as we understand it at the moment. It's going to take literally a worldwide crisis before everybody would be willing to do something else. But at the moment, we can we can count on greed and power by various different global elites moving in our favor because the real war we got going on right now in the world is nationalism versus globalism. And nationalism at the moment is winning. The British want to be British. The Italians want to be Italian. Um, in, in, and, and that's what Brexit is about. And that's what Trump's election is about. But these elections have been going to, the, to these nationalist figures. These, I, I guess you could call them Trump-like figures. The media calls them populist figures. The establishment has lost all these elections. And they've all gone to these other leaders who are basically care more about their country. They don't mind being a part of the world community, but they want to remain, have their own sovereignty, and they want to remain and keep their culture, their history, their identity as a nation. And we know that the Lord created nations. So what does the enemy want? Well, he wants to get rid of nations. He wants everybody to be one nation because it's opposite of what, what God wants. So that's what's going on right now. And everybody's vying to be the top dog, the top currency, the top income, the top this, the top that. So at the moment, all of that's working to our favor. And we've got a little bit of a reprieve here so that we can all get prepared, whether it's practically, spiritually, financially, whatever it may be, so that we can prepare for what is coming down. It's eventually going to come at us. Um how does the the debt play into that cuz do you see the uh reset i mean like if they just are we at break um i'm not sure if they're going to have a break because of the way that the the network was changed but we'll keep going Fulton but i wanted to ask you how you see the debt playing out and then with china cuz you know the whole thing with the the new world order and the whole Albert Pike the agenda to bring forth uh, a one world order as pretext to cause this conflict and that um, the Western nations are supposed to be brought to their knees and then the atheistic the communist the godless countries would fill that power vacuum and certainly it seems like the debt and the way that China owns a large part of this debt that it somehow is playing into that. Um, They have demanded infrastructure from the United States as payment on that debt. For instance, the two deep water ports, one in California, the other one here in the the Bahamas, Uh, even the infrastructure as far as interstates and toll roads, things of that nature as payment on the interest of this debt. And so um, any idea, any speculation on how that will all play out? And and do you think that that has anything to do also with the whole agenda as far as the the FEMA camps and um, that, you know, the the United Peacekeeping Troops sitting um, idly by manning those kind of places here in the United States? Well, there's a lot, there's a lot to answer there. Yeah, sorry. 
Oh, no worries. Um, but but basically, uh, the situation is here's kind of where things are at at the moment. At the end of 2018, it took 105 percent of the U.S. GDP to make to pay the maintenance, the debt maintenance on the debt that they have, which is now almost 23 trillion. The the uh, in in the EU, it takes 180 percent of their GDP uh, of their of their GDP to service their debt, and they're printing still 1.8 trillion euros a year, and they're uh, well, they're at negative 0.4 interest rates at the moment, and so so then uh, in Japan that's been printing 200 billion yen per month for like eight years, their debt is uh, their GDP. GDP to debt, it takes over 400% of the Japanese GDP to service its current debt. And in China, it's, it's about 126% of its GDP to service its debt. But in Australia, it's only 35% of its GDP to service its debt. And there is no debt over in uh in, well, at least there wasn't, in Hong Kong and Singapore and other nations in the world. So not all the nations have done what we've done. Uh So consequently, um, when you begin to take a look at this, what China will probably do is China uh, will probably severely cut the value of its currency. Not right now, because they're trying to play, they're trying to be like one of the guys at the table. And if they were to do that, they would be ostracized size to the point where, you know, they'd be in a lot of trouble. So, but, but eventually they're probably just going to cut, cut their uh, currency by probably 25, 30%. Now, if they do that, that cuts their debt by 25 or 30%. It devastates their people, but it makes them really good, look good on the international books. And basically they could pay off their, their debt with the reserves that they still have. But that's something that, that that's an expectation that may occur in the future. But what about these other nations? Well, there's no way that Japan's going to be able to pull, you know, figure out what the debt that it has. It's going to eventually default. There's no way that the EU can pull out of the debt that it has. It's eventually going to default. And there's no way we can pull out uh, of our debt either. And uh, we will eventually default Mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter whether you have a few zeros and you make a little bit money or you make a lot of money and you have a lot of zeros. If you carry on too much debt, people go bankrupt and nations default. We've seen it happen. Argentina, Cyprus, Venezuela, Port, uh, Puerto Rico, all of these things, you know, have occurred. And here in Michigan, we had the biggest city in the world default. And and then, um, you know, right now it looks like I'm not sure which one's going to win the race, but either either you know, either California or Illinois will probably end up becoming the first state in the union to default. Illinois came literally, I think, less than a week away from defaulting. And, 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 and what does it mean to default and how quickly can it occur? It can occur because if you're a state or you're a nation. And your bonds fall below investment grade. We have triple A, double A, A, triple B, double B, B, triple C, double C, C. And so, and so B means below investment grade. So if your debt, if your, if your bonds, your debt securities for any state or any nation is declared by the three main, um, the three main creditors in the world, um, Fitch, uh, Moody's, or Standard & Poor's, which again came from where? Well, the Bretton Woods Accords. If they declare you as below investment grade, then immediately all of your securities cannot be put in a fixed and guaranteed portfolio. So every bank, every, um, every mutual fund, municipal fund, everything has to remove that state, that nation's debt, because it no longer can be in their fixed and guaranteed portfolio because of the fact that 
Well, it's below investment grade, and you, and according to the rules, you can't do that. So all it takes is one day. The day after they're declared that, they literally could could go bankrupt and default. And Spain came close to that. France came close to that uh, back in 2011. And, um, and, 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 and Illinois literally was a week away from that. And so, so the reason it, they, it, it all happens so quickly is your normal bank portfolio has 60% of its fixed and guaranteed portfolio or more is, consi- is usually in a state or uh, a national uh, debt. And so if that state or nation is ruled to be insolvent, then almost all your banks can go bankrupt in a day. See, that's why it can happen so quickly. So, so what's going on right now is the U.S. is in a pretty good position, at least at the moment. Lowest unemployment rates in years. Economies humming along. Uh, people are still spending money. Stock market, amazingly, is still up up there, but it it. it can go up or down hundreds of points on a given day um, with all somebody has to do is say something and it can go up or down so much. And that's not a stable market. But at the moment, we're in a pretty good shape. Our dollar is very strong. Um, and it's probably going to stay that way until probably after elections in November of next year, if possible, because I believe President Trump will do everything he can to buoy that in order to keep that in that position. Um, however, you know, I don't know if the stock market will be able to make it that long. We'll just have to see what happens. Every time you think it's going to, you know, keep going down, it pops up. So for example, it was really dropping in the first week of October after all the reports came in for the third quarter, which, which weren't so good. But then when Russia and uh, China decided to have a ceasefire in their trade war, well, the market shot back up again and everybody says, oh, everything's OK. Well, everything's not OK, but at the moment <laughs> it's just shooting back up. I mean, when I started, when I used to be a financial advisor, my wife and I were for over 20 years and a big day in the market when we started out were like 25 points. I mean, that was a big day today. 25 points. People think nothing happened. And so. So there's a huge change. And we also have to remember, I, I don't know about you, but the first house I bought, my interest rate was 14%. And when my, my uh, fr- some friends of ours, a couple months later, bought it, it was 18%. And when, and when Reagan took over in the first quarter of 1981, interest rates in America were 21%. That was the prime rate. So we forget what what the way things were or what could happen in a very short time because interest rates have been down so low for so long now we i mean hardly anybody has a memory of what happened before right so 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 basically you're in a situation where i think we'll eventually default and and because there's no way we can we can pay it back and and, you know, and some people say, well, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen if we were default? Well, OK, let's let's understand that business isn't defaulting. People aren't defaulting. The government's defaulting. And and so, you know, if they default on Tuesday, what happens Wednesday? Well, not a lot. And and so what's going to happen is people who are on government payments, whether they be welfare, disability or Social Security or Medicare um, or, or, or Medicaid. I mean, there's going to be some problems there. But most people, what are they going to do on Wednesday? If if we were to default on Tuesday, they're going to get up and go to work because they're still going to work. They're still going to produce stuff. We're not going to be one day producing everything and the next day producing nothing because because we you know a lot of places. Are, are, are they, they know what's coming down the chute. And so in one respect, there'll be, there'll be difficulties for sure. But, but sometimes, you know, we, we think, oh gosh, this is going to happen. And oh gosh, that's going to happen. But I think most of the FEMA camps uh, or places that have been set aside 
are going to be setting aside, not for the people that live in the middle of the country and in all the small little towns throughout America. It's going to be for all the people that don't know how to do anything. They're going to riot in the, in the major metropolitan cities who aren't going to have any clue on what to do or how to do it. Well, where are they going to go? Where are they going to go where they're told? They're going to go where they're told to go. And they're probably going to go to those places. And that's primarily what many of those, you know, places are going to be filled up with. And, you know, what? let's say they called martial law. I was talking to a Tea Party group, oh, a few years back up in Upper Michigan in a place called Vassar. And I, and as I was talking with them, um, they said, well, what happens if martial law comes? And I said, guys, I said, if martial law comes, they're not coming to Vassar. I could hardly find Vassar. In fact, <laughs> you're probably going to have more freedom and be left alone more than you've ever been in your whole life because you're not a strategic place, you know? So you're probably going to, you know, you're, you're probably going to, nobody's even going to know about you or care about you. No offense. Mm-hmm. And so they all started laughing when they started thinking <laughs> about it. So sometimes we need to think beyond the, you know, the moment. Okay. So, so what if they defaulted? What if they called martial law? Well, what is exactly that going to mean? You know, I live in a place called Otsego. Is it strategic in any way to the federal government or the state? No, it's not. It's primarily an ag- agricultural community. And, you know, nobody's really going to care a whole lot. So so we, we really need to understand that and, and, and begin to think beyond it. And, and the other thing is we're not supposed to be in fear or we're not supposed to be all worried about what are they going to do? Because guess what? It doesn't matter what they do, whoever they are, because, because who's going to take care of us? Well, you know. God's going to take care of us. Yahshua is going to take care of us. He's going to be the one that 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 basically is is going to take care of his people. Now, yes, we may need to do something, um, but at the same token, you know, our faith, our hope, our trust isn't in the government. It isn't in the economy. It isn't in all these things. Well, it's in Him. Amen. So, as we go through all this, we need to remember that, and and so and so. I, you know, I believe it's going to be an amazing time because if you have a plan, well, you know what? Everybody who doesn't have a plan, which will be most people, they're going to follow you. If you have any idea what to do, they're going to do whatever you tell them. When we go down to a disaster area where you got a whole bunch of people trying to do something, but it's kind of all disorganized. We did this back in Gosh, when we went down to Hurricane Katrina, they had taken over a wind, a wind Dixie where they had all these provisions, but it was just a mess. It was very confusing. And it, and it was, it was, you know, there wasn't a lot of order to it. God bless the people with what they were trying to do. But we, I took a bunch of guys and I went and were taking trees off of houses and putting tarps on. And I left my daughter who, you know, was 21, but she looked about 17. She's only five, two. And she was told to go into the, into the warehouse and try to help order things. Well, when I got back there, she's standing up on a crate with a bullhorn directing the entire operation. (laughs) And, 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 And how did she do it? Well, she went in, she came up with a plan and a diagram looking at how everything was and decided she would start getting people to put all the food over here and all the clothes over here and all the water over here and all the personal items over here. And she just started saying, why don't you put that over here? Hey, why don't you put that over there? And then people started seeing what she was doing, and then they started going up to her and say, what should I do with this? And then she started saying, why don't you do that? And it wasn't that they looked at this young girl who, you know, who's 5'2", as being an expert. She just had a plan, and nobody else did. So they just right. did what she said. So, so, I mean, it's an example of, of what happens when you have a disaster and nobody else has got a plan. They're going right. to follow the guy that does. Absolutely. Yeah, because uh, you need kind of some organization to um, discombobulate all the chaos. And certainly mm-hmm. a lot of people um, get flabbergasted in moments of crisis. And that's why we saw, even with Katrina, how people just directed to go to the Superdome. They went there, and the insanity that ensued and the danger that they put themselves in 
just because they were guided and directed to go there, they had no other options that, you know, it was, it was insanity. Yeah. Um, and there was no help there for six, seven days, no food, no water, no nothing. And, um, it, supposedly there was reports of a lot of rape, a lot of crime and a lot of, um, just you know, very, uh, disgusting and very um, unattractive happenings uh, yeah. you know, with all of that. Uh, and so, yeah, very, very true. And so it's your opinion, Congressman, that, and also um, for the people that, are, that have been lately tuning in and all the people in the chat room, we appreciate all the questions. Uh, they really love you, Congressman, and all that you are talking about. I am interviewing Congressman Fulton Sheen, and he's been speaking about emergency preparation. He absolutely is a believer, and like myself, you know, just like with Israel going into the wilderness, they were instructed to take provision, but being out there for 40 years, you know, they they had to learn to depend on the Most High God, and were even fed manna from heaven, and so um, I think, yes, we should absolutely be prepared in whatever ways that we can but first and foremost is to be right with the most high god and to know to have and to trust in that relationship um but again the practicality of a crisis situation is that you do have some preparation and use your common sense to kind of watch out and to look out for those things that are coming, even with what happened in Katrina, we s talked about how the shells were emptied in three hours, and then there was no assistance for um, six, seven days, and that that assistance was delayed, and that people really suffered from not having set aside anything or even had any kind of consideration, any kind of plan. And so, if you would, can for those that are just joining us, Congressman, outline in guidance again your suggestions, and then let's review uh, what you had talked about with what you see happening to the cities and then to rural populaces. Yeah, I think that, you know, in many ways, I mean, strategically, they understand they don't have enough people to try to to make everybody subject to whatever it is they want. So they're going to focus their attention on the metropolitan area. Why? Because there's a lot of people there that, you know, they, they, they basically are already reliant upon the government. And they're also, you know, they, 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 they don't have a garden. They don't know how to get water. They don't know how to get food. If the, you know, they, they right. have, they, they're just in a situation where, where, you know, you don't have rioting in a town of 5,000 people, usually. You have rioting uh, in large populous areas when, when there are problems. Like, for example, right now in Iran. Iran, literally, in the last week, has admitted that it was doing all these atrocities to its own people. And they withdrew their troops, their army, from the various different, uh, their metropolitan areas because things were getting so desperate that when the people are hungry enough and things are desperate enough, they don't care if somebody shoots them. They, they're going to, they're going to begin to a point where they, they could take over and take over the government. I mean, that's how they got there in the first place. So they literally backed off because of the unrest that's going on over there in Iran. Cause they, because of all the economic sanctions and everything on them. So, so, so basically you know, China is doing is is having the other thing happen. They're ruthlessly going after all of their 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 religious groups, whether they be Christians, Jews, um, you know, Buddhists, um, some of the other groups, uh, Islamic, and they're literally putting them in concentration camps, re-education buildings and camps, and and um, they lit 
and, and the Wall Street Journal came out with an article talking about how they literally were selling organs that they were taking out of some of these people. They were just harvesting them. So, you know, this is going on in China right now. And you, does most people know about that? No. Um, but so what's going to happen in, you know, especially to a, a group of people like most U.S. citizens who aren't used to being told what to do, and when they are told what to do, they twit and they get on Facebook and, you know, they freak out, um, you're going to have a lot of unrest. And those people are going to be put in those places that have been set aside for them because because they're going to be the ones that can't be controlled. They're going to be the ones that are going to riot and do stuff because they already do it. But when you, you really give them a problem, when there's a real problem present, well, then they're really going to do it. And in most of the small towns and the communities out there, I mean, they may not even hardly be aware because they're not going to come out there. Why? Because they don't have the manpower to come out there and they don't care. Right. Let them right. alone. They're not going to stop us from doing what we want. So we'll just let them do what they want. We Take a look at Russia. Or not Russia, but what used to be the USSR. When I was growing up, who were the biggest two main uh, world powers in the world? The United States and the USSR. That's who they were. But what happened? One day... They ran out of money, they turned out the light, they shut the door, and you didn't hear anything about Russia or all these nations for 10 years. And why? Because they they defaulted. There was no more money, there was no more structure, there was no more army, there was no more anything. And so pretty much what happened? Well, the various different regions ran themselves. Various leaders rose up, some of them were in criminal in nature, and some of them actually were really good. And so these people, they, they were just left alone for the first time in their lives. They'd never been left alone. So so what's going to end up happening, that's not a, a, too unlike. I mean, was there more structure like in Moscow or Leningrad? Well, yeah. But just like there would be far more structure in New York and Chicago and Miami and L.A., um, but, you know, out in normal USA? Probably not. And so, so what's going to, what's going to end up happening is, is instead of your local township, city, village, or county, which usually has about five people attend their meetings, well, what's going to happen? Well, instead of deciding how many cemetery plots to add to the cemetery or how many, how much road they're going to pave that year, they're going to sit down and say, what can we do to keep everybody going? And, and who are they going to care about? Well, they're going to care about their people. And is that millions of people or thousands of people? Well, it might be thousands, but it's probably more like hundreds. And they're going to be figuring out what can they do together to make it work. And, and, and that's what it's going to be like in most places. And, and, the, and I told you earlier that program called CERT, which is Community Emergency Response Teams, most of the people that we've trained, that the 1,600 some people that we've trained, are on uh, are on all of these different boards and uh, you know volunteer boards across uh, across the uh, Michigan and the U.S. And so, who's going to be basically facilitating everything that needs to be facilitated? They're going to know what's going on. They'll have even if it's even if it were were. Uh, uh, martial law, they'll have these nice little tags that allow them to go out and do something. It's going to be a whole bunch of believers because it was believers who we trained. We did most of our trainings in churches. And so, so it's amazing that those things are out there, but they're going to rely upon their volunteer boards and their people to run their area because they're not going to have national guard in these small little towns and cities. They're going to have their guys. And, you know, in your average township or small little city, it doesn't have a hundred cops. It might have two. And so it's just kind of the way that it is. So we really need to begin to think beyond the, oh, my gosh, martial law. Oh, my gosh, the U.S. defaults. Oh, my gosh, this or that and the other. We need to think beyond that and think, well, what does that really mean? 
when I was a state representative uh, over in Michigan, um, for the first two terms, um, the Republicans were in control. And then in my last two years, the Democrats were in control. And all of a sudden, for the first time in Michigan history, we didn't pass a budget in time. Uh, and so in an effect, um, it was like the government was going to shut down because we didn't do it soon enough. And I had a reporter come to me about a week before that. And they said, well, are you really trying to, you know, prevent the government from sh shutting down? And I said, no. And they said, well, no. Well, what do you mean? And I said, OK, let me ask you a question. If the government were to shut down on Tuesday, what do you think is going to happen on Wednesday? And they said, well, uh, uh, and and they couldn't think of anything. They said, well, oh, I know you couldn't get a car license. I said, actually, you can. It's all automated. You can print out a piece of paper and they'd send you the piece of plastic later. I said, you know what the real problem is? The real problem is, is they're scared to death that if the that if the government stopped functioning and nothing and, and, and ceased, that nobody would notice. That's what they're really scared <laughs> of. And so so. You know, most of the police forces are supported by property tax, which is a local tax. It has nothing to do with the state. And so, you know, the governor said she was going to issue uh, a list of of uh, non-essential government entities. Well, great. I'd love to have that list, wouldn't you? Because if they're non-essential, why do we have them? So I'm looking forward to the list from the governor. And so, so all in all, I mean, it's we just have to step beyond the that that thought process or that 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 fear because 350 times it says in the bible do not fear well let's not fear what does it really mean and what would you really do and what's your plan and so just like in those sherlock sherlock holmes movies where the newer ones where he's he's about to go into a fight and you see the whole fight before he actually does it he sees it in his mind and then and then the fight occurs and he does everything that he thought was going to happen, move, counter move, et cetera. We really need to do that. We need to decide what we're going to do. So when everybody reacts to what's going on around us, we've thought through it. And what, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do what we planned. We're going to do step one, step two, step three, step four. And when all these different things happen, we're not going to be going, oh, my gosh, how did that happen? We'll have already thought about it because we came up with a plan. To deal with it. That's why the that's why the Lord says, be watchful, be alert, be men and women who understand the times and know what to do. So that when those times come, they're not going to follow the state government. They're not going to stop follow the federal government. They're going to follow you because you don't seem to be freaked out like everybody else because you have a plan. And they're not going to care where you got the plan. They just want one. And when you finally tell them where it comes from, well, they'll probably buy into that fairly quickly. Uh, I have a question. Uh, um, um, where are you as far as, you know, the the criminal element, like the, the drug cartels that are uh, running rampant and flooding the country with um, – you know, with methamphetamines and drugs and heroin and all of that, and also with uh, the right to bear arms and, um, you know, guns and protection and that kind of thing. Um, being a Christian, a lot of people, you know, tend to want to be pacifists, um, but in protecting and protect as far as preserving family, uh, how, where is your stance with, um, with all of that? Well, David, Abraham, Moses, the sons of Jacob were anything but pacifists. <laughs> yeah. And 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 so and so consequently, I mean, do I want in any way to shoot someone, kill someone, hurt someone? No. But if my family is threatened, will I take action? Absolutely. Absolutely. And 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 so, you know, I've you know, I've I've been uh, a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. I'm a member of the NRA. You know, I I, I mean, 
I, it's not like I go shooting a lot of things. I mean, there, there's a question, what do you shoot? And I, I always check varmints because I, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I got to shoot something, but I mean, I basically shoot targets, you know? So, so all in all, I mean, if it's a real shooting war, I'm not real good at it. So, you know, it probably wouldn't go well, but the bottom line is, you know, I'm take, you know, I'm going to take care of my family if something happens there. And I don't think, honestly, that I have to worry about the local officials in, in my area, because in some ways, you know, especially with being a part of the working with my emergency director, you know, we're actually probably going to be working together, but uh-huh. you know, the concern that you have are some of these roving groups yeah. that make them out. Now, if the roving groups are really big, the government's going to take them out because it's going to screw up their plans. Okay. So, so, you know, they don't want you know, them screwing up and getting in their way. So if it gets too big, they're going to take them out themselves. However, um, you know, if it's, if it's, it's smaller groups, well, you know, like if they came over to, to where we are, I mean, we probably could take care of most small groups if they Uh came here. My daughter and son-in-law live 400 feet away from us with my three granddaughters and uh, my other uh, daughter and son-in-law would bring their trailer over and we they'd come over here. So we'd have three families right here and uh, and the rest of the people, you know, in in this little area, we're out, we're out in the country uh, that's that's on our, our street, you know, they're all very amenable. And so we'll probably be fine, mm-hmm. you know, and and so, again, you just have to. You have to make these decisions and think through them beforehand, because if you're wondering what you're going to do when you're faced with a situation like that, then you're going to hesitate and and that could create a problem. But if you've already made the decision on what you're going to do in a situation like that, then, you know, when it happens, you're not going to be travailing over what to do. You've already made that decision. You're just going to do it. So, again, do I want to hurt anybody? Absolutely not. If they threaten my family, well, then I'll do what I have to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm I'm with you um, with regard to all of that as well. And as far as community gathering and reaching out to other individuals, you said that you know of this program called CERTS, uh, but are there others that... Um, you can recommend that people uh, that are wanting to, you know, get with others that may have some kind of plan that have organization or have training with the things that you have been mentioning here. Uh, where can they go? What can they look to? How would they uh, group together with others? Um, and yeah. and what, what can they search for? Well, we've trained, uh, we've trained people, all over the place in Texas and Kansas city and Michigan and Missouri and, and, uh, you know, Florida. And so we know a lot of wonderful groups and people out there, a lot of, uh, organizations that, you know, that, that, um, they're, they're disaster relief groups, but almost every one of them is also a kind of a preparation group. And they've all got quite frankly, great relationships with, with their local community because they help them. And, you know, some of them were wary of them at first, but, you know, they were very thankful that they could do what they do. And so um, what what one of the things that we're trying to do and we're you know trying to put together is if somebody wants to know uh, what's going on in their community, they're free to go ahead and just give us give me an email. They can they can uh, email me at fsheen at gmail dot com uh, again, f sheen at gmail.com but they can also go to go to our uh, go to the isaiah 5812.org website and they can send an email that way um but but uh one of the things we're trying to do is is put together networks we've put together financial networks we've put together uh kind of alternative health care networks we've put together disaster relief networks because i I've always sensed and believed that that in the end times, the end time remnant is going to be networked together. And and mm-hmm. so we're trying to put these things together to help people in different areas of the country be able to identify, well, who can I go to for this or for that? 
and and kind of almost be a clearinghouse for those things. And so I think um, the best thing is, is if somebody has an inquiry, just just ask. But the other thing that we do, like we do these trainings all the time. If somebody wants to have a cert training in their area, um, they can contact uh, Isaiah 5812 uh, org again and just let us know and we'll send the template on how to do it. We'll find a date to do it and then we'll bring our team down there and we'll do the cert training and we'll train up a bunch of people. And, and I usually will contact the county that we go down to and let them know that we're coming and send them all my certificates so that they, they know I'm, 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 I'm for real and give them the ability to contact our emergency director if they need to. But most, most of the time they're thrilled to have people you know, be able to get trained to work with police and fire and, and emergency people. And I mean, you know, if they have to go search a, like 50 homes in a neighborhood and uh, because of a tornado or a flood and you search those 50 homes and you find two of the homes where there's some significant damage and there's people trapped. Well, now the professionals, the emergency officials, they don't have to go to 50 homes. They only need to go to two. So, so they're very happy to have people come in. And, and when you take the course, you get, you, you learn how to come up with your own plan. You learn how to do all kinds of basic medical and uh, things that, that help people and stabilize people. Because most people in an accident or in a disaster, it, they don't necessarily die from the injuries they've experienced. They die from shock in relationship to the in, uh, in, injuries. But you learn how to deal with shock and, and uh, prevent those you know things or, or mitigate them until – Somebody with more skills can get there. But the goal is, is, is uh, I would say, just let us know and we'd be happy to come do a training. We'd be happy to try to tell you who's available in your area if we know. Um, and uh, our goal is just to network the body of Christ together. So when, when things do hit the fan, it's going to be it's going to be all about relationships and it's going to be established relationships between various believers that are going to be able to get resources and and uh, things to people and people to those resources in a time of difficulty. Mm -hmm. Amen. Um, Congressman, if you would, can you give out your website contact information where people can go to read your articles and also make mention again of the broadcast that you are um, doing weekly. Sure. You can, you can, uh, contact, uh, contact, you can go to Fulton Sheen updates.com. That's Fulton Sheen updates.com. And, uh, on that, there's all kinds of articles that I've written. There's, uh, presentations that I've done, uh, various YouTube presentations and, uh, information. And uh, you can go over to that, um, and if you want to get uh, join the blog, it doesn't cost anything. It just it just alerts you when a new article is put out there. And I'm just about to finish the third quarter article uh, where I kind of give an update on what's going on uh, economically, financially, and politically in the world. And I I usually put one of those out every quarter, and uh, and then I post it on the blog so that people can say, well, what happened in the third quarter? Well. Here's what happened. The other thing that you can go to is Isaiah5812.org. That's our disaster relief site. And we have some information on that site. We just recently redid it, and we're going to be adding uh, some substantial more, substantially more content to it. Um, you can also um, – uh, we have a show uh, from 7 to 8 on, um, on crossing over. Uh, that's uh, Jessica Arianis' uh, uh, YouTube channel. And we're on from 7 to 9 on Tuesday nights. That's Eastern Standard Time, seven to, or not 7 to 9, 7 to 8 Eastern Standard Time. And then, uh, and then you can find those rebroadcasts either on Crossing Over or on my blog. And then if you just have some questions you want to ask, again, you can send it you can send it to the blog. You can send it to the Isaiah site. You can send it to the email that I gave you just a moment ago, fsheen at gmail.com. And I'll be happy to answer the question, you know, uh, as best you can. But but uh, what we, you know, what we've done and what I, you know, do is I go and I speak about international economics, global markets, and, and uh, political economics. Uh, I do a lot of speaking on 
shows like this and and uh, uh, physically and writing about it. Um, but uh, we also help uh, businesses create structures instead of creating debt structures. When we're trying to put uh, dollars together for a business or help a business form, we try to create net profit net net profit structures, which means that there is no debt involved, but people are actually, you know, investing in businesses and in people, whether it's a $10,000 machine for a welder who wants to expand his business, whether it's a hyperbaric chamber that's going into a medical massage facility, um, whether it's, uh, we, we have another th- uh, one that we do for uh, uh, Christian schools using a Christian um, uh, clothing clothing wear, uh, as opposed to using Nike and giving the school a a really good deal. Um, and, but whatever it is, you know, we'll, you know, we, we, we show people how to invest in people and in other businesses. And, uh, we create these structures because our goal is to correct, to try to, to create structures of refuge, if you will, just the same way as there'll be cities of refuge and places of refuge. We believe you can create structures of refuge that are more scriptural and more like what was intended to be. And, you know, we try to help people figure out, well, you know, what should I, what should I do with, you know, the, the talents God's given me? Because when you look at the story of the talents in Matthew 25, you have three people. The first two people, uh, the one person did really well and really, you know, uh, expanded the number of talents that, uh, he was given. And then the second one, not as much as the first, but both of them, you know, were blessed and received more. And the only person that lost everything is the person that did nothing. So we do need to understand that, that the Lord expects right. us right. to do something. However, however much it is, it, it doesn't have to be as much as more than you can do. It just means to be do something. Peter couldn't walk on water till he stepped out of the boat. So we just need to learn that sometimes the Lord just wants you to begin to move in that area and he'll take what you do and he'll expand it and he'll multiply it. But you just have to do something. Amen. And I think that's really what is required of us in being watchmen and watchwomen and for those of us that know and are aware of the New World Order and the coming reign of the Antichrist, the beast system, um, the New World Order, world government, all of that, that we should do the best we can to sound the trumpet and to prepare people for those things that are coming. Um, and with regard to the end of days and all of that, what kind of do you expect or what do you see coming on the horizon or what are you looking for? Um, any any particular signs or anything of that nature? Well, you know, when 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 uh, when Yahshua was asked that question, mm. he said, "Well, let's take a look at the fig tree." Now, I wish he would have said more than that, but nevertheless, he said, "Let's take a look at the fig tree." Now, when 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 you begin to see the buds and you begin to see the leaves on that on that fig tree, you'll know that that time is not far off. Mm-hmm. So, so one of the things we try to do, and and we've done presentations on this. Um, what do you do in a crisis, and how do you prepare for a crisis, and what are the financial uh, fig leaves and uh, buds that we need to watch for so that when they when we begin to see these unfold, what do we do? And so we've got a lot of presentations that talk about that, that you can watch, listen to, read. Um, but, you know, in my, you know, as I'm watching things unfold and they are unfolding at a break breakneck pace. Yes. And yes, Back in World War II, did they think it could have been the end of the world then? Well, they did, except in World War II. Congressman, you there? Hold on, everybody. I think we may have lost Fulton. I'm going to see if I can add him again to the call. Uh, 
bear with us. I will state that um, while we're waiting for the congressman with regard to the end times, uh, Yeshua did speak about in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, not only the blooming of the fig tree, but he said um, that there will be rumors of wars, uh, nations rising against nation, the waves and the seas roaring. Uh, he also said, be weary of, um, of false prophets. All right, hold on. Fulton did ask me to call again, so... Let's see if we can add him. But, um, and I do believe that the blooming of the fig tree had something to do with the nation of Israel as well. And so, let's see. All right. Here we go. And that the it was an indication that we are the the final generation. Fulton, are you there? Hello? Okay. All right. Yeah, we just, um, you were talking about the, the fig tree, and so Hello? we'll give you, yeah, can you hear me? Fulton? Uh, we can hear you. Let me type that out for him. Go ahead, Congressman. Well, I apologize for the technical difficulties, everyone. At least we were able to m manage and make it through most of the show, and I apologize for the technical difficulties. Hopefully, we will have everything settled by next week. Uh, we lost them. I'm going to try calling one more time. And if not, we've only got a couple minutes remaining. So. And so if we can get them on for final comment, if not, then I'll close this out. And uh, again, we appreciate everybody taking the time to join us this evening. And Mitchell, I appreciate you hooking us up to the network, brother. And uh, thank you, everyone in the chat room. We've had quite a lively chat and many people joining us and um, I do want to just bring out a remembrance of Nighthawk and all that he did for all of us in bringing forth truth and allowing us to have this platform so many speakers so many hosts um, I, I know myself even though I had been on the air for long time prior, uh, it was my joining the hijacker and guest appearance here on the network that really led me to be able to join uh, this family. And, you know, I do appreciate all of the different individuals and all of the different hosts and all of the different information that is brought forth to this network. I absolutely believe you know, those of you that come here, the share fellowship with us to be some of the wisest and most well-researched individuals okay. in the world. Are you there, Fulton? I am. Okay. Uh, yeah, we've only got like a minute remaining. So if you would, can you just uh, end us with final comment? Sure. I'd say right now... Um, we are privileged to live at a time where so many um, have left that prophetic wall to be in, and to uh, uh, have 
have hoped they would be able to be a part of, and we're privileged to be able to see all these different things unfolding. And, you know, in this time, the Lord is going to have us do things that uh, nobody's ever done before. And we're going we're gonna to learn about the secrets of the ages. And no matter how difficult or dark it gets, that light's going to trumpet because there's many more people moving towards darkness. But while the dark is darker with lots more people, the light's getting more intense with the people who are walking in the light. So we're going to be able to do things that no one's ever done. And I'm looking forward to that big time. I'm looking forward to being able to be a part of that that group, that age, that that end time remnant that's going to be able to see and experience all these things that nobody else has ever experienced. So we're very privileged. I'm very Amen. much looking forward to seeing what the Lord's going to do next. Amen. And with that, Fulton, thank you so much for joining us in broadcast. I'm glad that we were able to bring and to bring your message forward to the listening audience. And certainly I'll be checking in with you and uh, we'll do an update sometime, at, um, you know, maybe after the conference, the November conference, I'll uh, have joy schedule you again. And thank you again, Congressman, for yeah. your willingness. And we appreciate you and be blessed in all of your efforts and all that you do. God bless everybody. Thank you very much. It's Pleasure being with you. Pleasure was all mine. God bless all. Good night. Until next week. Shalom. <laughs>